Um, I would like to welcome everyone. I'm Melanie Carlos, Executive Director of XMinds, the organization hosting tonight's event. All right, next, I just wanna go through some housekeeping for tonight's presentation. You're going to have lots of opportunities for questions tonight. Dr. Black will pause um, after each section of his presentation for Q&A and also allow time at the end. Uh, please write your questions for the for him in the chat and at any time um, we will you can write those at any time and we will read them out loud out loud when we get to the Q&A break. Helping us with the Q&A and providing information in the chat are XMinds volunteers Naomi Rubenstein, Sue Kaiser, and Sylvia Ho. Before we start, I want to quickly mention we are recording this in English and uh, when our translator comes in, it will be in Spanish as well, hopefully. We will make the recordings and presentation slides av available to you in a few days. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. David Black. We are all very fortunate tonight to have someone who's truly an expert to teach us how to get the most from your child's neuropsych evaluation. Dr. Black is a pediatric neuropsychologist and director and co-founder of the Center for Assessment and Treatment right here in Chevy Chase, Maryland. He is an internationally recognized expert on autism spectrum and related disorders. Prior to founding the Center for, for Assessment and Treatment, Dr. Black was a researcher in the pediatrics and developmental neuroscience branch at the National Institute of Mental Health NIH. His research examined factors that contribute to the best outcomes among children and adolescents with autism spectrum disorder. For the past 20 plus years, he has worked clinically with children, adolescents, and adults with autism spectrum disorders. His comprehensive reports help his patients learn the strengths and differences that make each person unique. Recently, his work has focused on transition to adulthood and the role stress and anxiety can have on autistic individuals. As well as being a highly respected member of our professional community, Dr. Black is also a longtime supporter of X-Minds. He has spoken to our community several times in the past, and we are very fortunate to have him here again tonight. Dr. Black, thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'll turn it over to you now. Hey, uh, thank you so, so much. That was a really warm and kind and generous introduction. I'm going to go ahead and do a screen share so that we can look at some slides. Um, okay. Right. And can you guys confirm that you're looking at a slide deck? Yes, we are. Perfect. Thank you. All right. I'm just going to try to change the screen size a bit so it's a little bit bigger for you guys. Okay, let's try that. Okay. Um, okay, so we've got the background covered. Thank you so much. Um, I've got no conflicts of interest. Um, tonight, we're going to walk through what is a neuropsychological assessment. For a lot of you, I, I realize that that you you know. I'm going to try to highlight just a couple of main points. Um, I would do want to spend some time thinking together about the parent role and uh, parent expectations in the assessment process and and uh, how, how you can be pretty influential in maximizing the usefulness of the assessment process and the, the outcome. Uh, then I want to spend some time thinking about neuropsychological assessments and IEPs, uh, how you can leverage the uh, the report, the recommendations effectively to advocate for your child. And then we'll see where we are at that point. We, we might be pretty close to uh, running out of time, but if not, if we still have some time, then we've got a bunch of slides where we can look at common questions and answers that people often have. Uh, and as, as was said, we I'll take questions periodically as we go through. Thank you. Okay, so what's a neuropsychological assessment? It's a, it's a comprehensive look at your child's thinking and problem solving abilities. And it's the idea is we link it to brain function. We're trying to draw a connection between what your brain does and what you need for everyday functioning. We prioritize strengths, but we also try to understand areas of need, weaknesses. Um, we try to understand the ideology of challenges. 
are the challenges that your child's or you you or your child is faced with are they brain based are they caused by the environment is it a combination of the two is it an intersection between a mismatch between what you do well and what the environment needs it's designed to clarify diagnoses it is a useful tool for progress monitoring to just understand change over time to understand the effectiveness of the treatment interventions that you're doing and it's useful for looking at prognosis what can i expect in two years three years eight years etc um, depending on the age of the child and within all of that, it's useful to guide treatment planning. What is a neuropsychological assessment? Uh, kind of taking that a step further. A, a, it's broader. That There were a bunch of questions that came in that was trying to anchor this in how it compares to a psychoeducation assessment or a traditional psychological assessment or other kinds of assessments. Neuropsychological assessments differ from other types of evaluations in a couple of key ways. The first way is it's, it's typically broader and more comprehensive. And the second way that it differs is it, it's intentionally designed to link back to brain function, whereas other types of assessments may not have that explicit purpose in mind. A, and a neuropsychological assessment usually includes an assessment of cognitive skills, attention and executive functioning, learning and memory, and there's usually some sort of a social emotional screening. From there, uh, more comprehensive assessments have more components and less comprehensive assessments have fewer components, but those components are typically driven by the referral question or the, the site where the testing is being done. Uh, for example, if you're getting testing done in a private practice that primarily works with children, you're very likely to also have a look at academic achievement. If you're doing it in a hospital-based practice that primarily works with neurologists that are focusing on seizure disorders and uh, brain injuries, then uh, academic achievement is probably not going to be part of the assessment. Um, temperament and regulation is probably not going to be part of the assessment, but language might be. So the other parts of an assessment might include language, fine motor skills, academic skills, social skills, uh, and, and social thinking, the things that underlie social skills. Uh, as I have here, temperament and regulation, and then adaptive functioning, the, pr the practical skills you need to, to navigate day-to-day -day life. Um, there are lots of questions about, does it matter where I get the assessment done? And the, the short answer is yes, it does. It, it, and the, the, the big point I, I wanna make with this slide is, a score is not the whole story. Just because your child gets a high score or a low score on a particular measure, you know, a measure of visual thinking or a measure of reading or a measure of, of language, doesn't really explain what's going on. A, a, a good neuropsychological assessment will not just give you a score, but will explain how that score came to be. And what does it mean? What does it mean if my child has a really high score here or a really low score there? That interpretation of the of the data, looking carefully at behavior observations and, and other pieces of the assessment that I'll talk about later, is critical to really getting a meaningful explanation and interpretation of the child's functioning. Um, you want to think about the experience and expertise of the clinician. Do, do they seem to, to have the background and experience for your child's specific needs? Do they have knowledge of the specific condition? Um, and do, it, it's going to be difficult to gauge this from a website, but you want to be thinking about how thorough are, are they in their behavior observations. And then something else you might also want to think about is what are you going to do next? Do you just need the assessment and from there you you know what you're going to do? You, you're prepared to navigate the IEP process. You have your treatment providers in place. You have your treatment team in place. Or is that something you need help with? Do you need help finding the right providers? Do you need help um, explaining your child's needs at an IEP meeting? That can be part of where you get the assessment done. Some providers are comfortable and readily uh, uh, support families at IEP meetings and others simply don't provide that as the scope of service that they do. Other things to consider is, is the clinician a good fit for your child's temperament for your specific needs? They can be, for example, an autism expert, but do they have experience with adults or do they have experience with four-year-olds? They can be an autism expert, but do they also have experience with reading disorders, if that's a part of what you're thinking about? Or do they have experience with, uh, with, with children who may have other avenues of communication than traditional language-based communication? And how are they prepared to help understand that and understand methods of communication and revealing strengths, if that is a difference for your child? 
Uh, in addition, you would be, of course, thinking about the, the logistics. Uh, what do they charge? Do they take insurance? Um, and how soon can they see my child? Uh, just a quick note here about insurance. Uh, a, a lot of private practice providers do not take insurance. They don't work directly with insurance networks. However, in the state of Maryland, if there is not a qualified in-network provider that, that can give the service that you need, the insurance is required to provide coverage for an out-of-network provider. In addition, if an in-network provider's wait list is too long, you know, you, you can get an assessment done at Children's, but they're telling you it's 12 to 18 months, that's probably too long a wait. You're permitted to go out of network. In those circumstances, the uh, evaluation should be covered at your in-network copay amount. The steps for doing that is, is you negotiate with, negotiate the wrong word. You, you make the request to the insurance provider, and it, it's a process that should not require the engagement of the out-of-network provider at all. It, it, it's something that you navigate with the insurance company directly. Okay. Neuropsychological assessments can be much more than just, here's a readout of your child's strengths and needs, and here's a set of recommendations to support their development. It, it can also provide, it, I think of it very much as a therapeutic process, an, an opportunity to, to understand your child better, an opportunity to understand how things fit together and why. Why is it that we have so, such challenges at 4.30 in the afternoon? Why is it that, that we seem to do swimmingly throughout the whole school day, but we melt down after school? Or why is it that math goes great, but, uh, but reading seems to be more challenged? And having insight around that can, can really make a huge difference in understanding your child and under, in reducing your frustration, your stress, and it can be instrumental in reducing trauma. Um, and in this case, I mean like little t trauma, you know, the trauma associated from feeling misunderstood, the trauma associated from, from having things expected of you that you really are not equipped to do. So in this case, I, I'm not talking about, you know, like an assault or something like that, which of, of course is, is its own challenge. Um, it also can be really useful in drawing out strengths, documenting, illustrating, and demonstrating how those strengths are, are uh, can be leveraged to, to allow your child to reach their optimal potential. To have that uh, be effective, it's important that the process is transactional um, between you and the examiner. So when should you consider getting a neuropsych? Uh, if you have confusion about your, or the school or a treatment provider has confusion about your child's behavior and the current strategies that are being used simply aren't enough. If there's a significant gap between effort and outcome, yet you see your child putting forth all kinds of effort, they're, they're giving 100% and you get uneven results or it just seems like it doesn't match. If there's a lack of diagnostic clarity, now, I, I know there's challenges here and there, but I don't know what the cause is, and that's impacting how uh, how I understand it. What what is this going to mean in two years or in five years? Or should I be going to to a speech language person, or should I be going to a psychiatrist, or should I be be pushing more for the school to be helping with something? If there's uncertainty about about the education plan or the broader treatment plan, if you simply need assistance with prioritizing treatment goals. You know, I know there's seven things my child needs, but I don't know what to do first. Uh, if you're going through a major transition, uh, if you're changing schools or if, uh, if there's a lot of post-secondary planning. So, you know, in those last three to five years of high school when you're thinking about, well, okay, then what? You know, I'm, I'm on this path, but I, I don't know if, if, uh, if we're going to college, which college, what other things do I need to be thinking about to make sure that uh, my child has uh, a maximum opportunity to live the life they want as an adult. Uh, another bunch of questions came through about how much can I trust the report? Uh, so how how much can I sort of say that this is, you know, that this is the 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 final word on on who my child is? And what I would say primarily is does the report, does the experience resonate with you? Does the explanations provided for who your child is, for their behavior, for their strengths, for their needs, for the way their mind works, make sense to you? Does it add up? Does the, the, the assembly of the data points come together in a way that you say, that's my kid? Um, does it feel comprehensive in its explanation or does it feel partial? 
you know, it's like, well, yeah, I know he's got anxiety, but I don't think that's the whole story. And I don't think anxiety is the root cause of what's going on. I think there's something else that's driving the anxiety. Did the report get to what that something else is, or are you still sitting with that? Um, related to this is questions about, well, how much, it, it gives me a good picture of today, but what's it going to tell me about tomorrow? What's it going to tell me about next year? What's it going to tell me about when he's 15 or when he's 28? There's a variety of, of factors that go into that, including age. And I've got a different slide that will talk about how far out you can predict um, based on the age of the child. So I'm going to save that for that slide. But you also want to think about unusual circumstances that might interfere with uh, a, a child's growth or trajectory. What I mean by that is the, the ability of an assessment findings to predict how a child's going to look in three years or five years is really going to be a function of do we have all the data points, all things being equal, meaning are, are is there a reason to think that the trend line that has been for the last two years is going to continue? And in the absence of, of specific causes, usually the answer is yes. But those causes might be a neurological condition that's interfering with learning and growing such as a seizure disorder or a major illness, uh, you know, a, a viral condition that's that's not being managed, that's significantly, you know, despite trying, but that's significantly interfering with accessing the curriculum, curriculum at school or is interfering with other opportunities for, for growth and progression. Um, is there something that's interfering with access to appropriate educational opportunities? You know, whether that's a, a communication challenge or a self-regulation challenge or or, or just you haven't found the right match for how your child learns, but you feel like you're on the path to doing so, well, that can impact to what degree you can take these findings when your child is six or eight and to have a sense of what they're gonna look like when they're 12. And then is there stress that is limiting their ability to really engage with the world around them? Is there a trauma that happened after the assessment? Is there trauma that is still unfolding that is that might interfere with how they're learning and growing? These are the kinds of things that uh, a snapshot in time, which is what a neuropsychological assessment is, uh, is not. Th these are the kinds of things that's going to limit how effectively it can predict what uh, your child's needs are going to be in the future. Um, if there's prior testing to establish a trend line. You know, we, we know how he looked when he was five and we know how she looks when she's eight and, and we can plot a line and we can begin to think about what does that mean for, um, for when they're 15. Um, another thing to think about in terms of can I trust the report? What was the testing experience like for your child? Was, was there challenges with mood that are atypical? Were, were they sick on that particular day? Um, was there something that happened that you felt was significantly disruptive to their ability to participate in the assessment process? Did they effectively establish rapport with the examiner? Or let me really say it more accurately. Did the examiner effectively establish rapport with your child? It really is the examiner's job, the child's child. If some of those things weren't optimally managed, um, did the that doesn't mean that the assessment is necessarily invalid. It means that that's something we need to talk about, is something we need to understand, and it's something that needs to be considered as we interpret the findings. And if there's something that we think was impacted by one of these extraneous factors or one of these very temporary factors, you know, like having a terrible head cold, is there something we can do to have some confirmation that the data we have is reliable? Can we do some supplemental testing on another day just to confirm that what we got on the day when there was a head cold seems to reliably uh, reflect your child, for example? And this should be a conversation you're having with the clinician. Okay, there's also limitations of neuropsychological assessments, and we want to think about that as well. Uh, the very nature of neuropsychological testing is that we try to give standardized measures that illustrate they give us a way to understand your child's functioning in the context of a population sample. So what that means is we need to administer the test in a way that is consistent with how it was administered with the standardization sample. And if we deviate from that too much, we can still learn a lot about your child, but the scores we get might not be useful. They might not be valid. And so from that standpoint, there's a limited ability for us to adapt to meet your child where they're at. Uh, no matter how skilled we are, no matter how hard we try, there can be some constraints there. 
There's ways around that to a degree, but still those are, there are some constraints. In addition, there may not be a measure for a particular strength. So your child might be particularly gifted at reading maps or recognizing certain patterns or might be a phenomenal at chess or something like that. We don't have measures that capture that. And so we're going to need to rely on behavior observations, a thorough background interview with you, um, and, and other creative ways to capture some of those strengths. Because we're not going to have a number that shows chess prowess or you know geography ability. Um, we may have difficulty capturing strengths or abilities within areas of strong interest. There's many folks I work with who who are are remarkably gifted and talented in areas that they're interested in, and um, they have difficulty demonstrating that same capacity in other areas. So if the assessment process itself doesn't allow that area of strength to really show up, we may not be able to capture those abilities within the data itself. And again, we need to have a thorough background interview and we need to have careful behavior observations to begin to, to close that gap. We also might not be able to capture abilities in real world settings. There's a big difference between uh, showing exceptional reading comprehension in an assessment in my office and applying that reading comprehension in an English class or uh, showing good uh, planning task prioritization and problem solving skills at the mall, even though you did a beautiful job of doing that on one of my in-office measures. We, the, the tests are designed to capture and, uh, and, and to sort of give us a, a read on what the real world looks like, but depending on how different your child's skills are by setting, we may over or underestimate strengths or challenges in some of those areas. Um, our ability to predict future skills and abilities will also vary. And uh, I talked a bit about that already, and there's another slide that talks about that. Other limitations of neuropsychological assessment is it's not as sensitive as I'd like it to be at the extremes. So if you are extremely good at something or you're extremely challenged with something, our, our numbers tend to not be as stable and as good a predictor. Uh, we've got limited tests available for non-English speakers. Some of the tests, many of the tests may lack cultural sensitivity. So you may hear a question within uh, a, a, a cultural experience that doesn't match that of the test authors. And, uh, and so you may answer in a way that makes a lot of sense, but doesn't conform to the way the test was written. And there, there is just really not standardization data yet for non-binary, non-cisgender individuals. Okay, this is a good a good moment to pause and to uh, ask some questions. Oh, let me go back and slide before we switch. Um, we had Dr. Black. We have a question from a parent. Um, does does CAD have template letters parents can use to request insurance to cover out of network neuropsych neuropsychological evals when in net when the in network waiting list is too long? We we don't have templates like that. It's it's a good idea. Uh, what we've found is it's more of a phone call than a letter. Um, uh, yeah, we don't have we don't have templates right now. I think it's something we can look into. Another parent asked, and I I asked the parent to clarify, and if they want to unmute and clarify the question, um, what if our child is five and cannot read or show all the academic strengths or weaknesses yet? And my question back to Becca was. Um, are you asking whether the child can still be tested in that situation? I don't know if Becca, you want to clarify that for Dr. Black. Sorry, I was, yeah, hi. <laughs> um, I was okay. more so wondering, you know, he, I'm still going to move forward with testing, but can you really get the full picture of him without being able to show all of those academic areas? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. Uh, th there is this misnomer out there that there's something magic about turning six, and that's it, it's just not true. You can do more when you're eight than when you're four, and you can do more when you're 24 than when you're eight. But at each of those stages, uh, testing is not appropriate in every situation with every child. But if there is a if something has brought you to this question, I'd like to get a neuropsychological evaluation done with my five-year-old. And assuming that whatever that reason is that you'd like to get it done, we have appropriate tools and measures to, to do so. 
So to, to use the concrete example of he's not yet reading, how can we understand that? There's a variety of pre-reading skills we can look at to make sure that he's moving in the direction he needs to be so that when reading is introduced in the curriculum at school, we can know if he has the foundation skills to proceed or if there are some things we should shore up in the meantime or are there are some things that we can anticipate might be challenging. Um, and we can go in the other direction as well, meaning we can think about the same thing with a four-year-old or a three-year-old. At those ages, we're not usually calling it a neuropsychological assessment. Instead, we're thinking about either a developmental assessment or a developmental neuropsychological assessment, which is just a way to say that as kids get bigger, we can uh, get more nuanced with how we look at things, but we can still look at things. It's really helpful to know because I think that's a common, common feeling that parents have. I just wanted to ask you a follow-up question for parents who might be thinking about this. For mm -hmm. parents who are thinking, you know, this is a huge financial expense, it might be helpful to wait, possible for to get a baseline for everything. And then there, if there are specific areas they want to test later, the neuropsychologist can just focus on those pieces. Um, I, I, there was a, a, a glitch in the audio. Do you mind just asking it again? Or I was just, um, I was inquiring for parents who might be thinking that if they wait, know that they can only test one time for example because of the expense yeah if they want to get a full neuropsych when the child is younger and then there are specific areas they want to address later does the entire neuropsych need to be repeated or are there pieces that you can focus on next without looking uh, at everything? that's a fantastic question uh, so can you focus on narrow pieces later absolutely one of the things you'll want to explore with the person you're having do the testing is how comfortable are they with doing that? We're very comfortable with doing that, and we think it's a great idea. Uh, so there, there is value in having a comprehensive neuropsychological assessment to get baseline data. And if when you are in that situation where the cost is something that you're not going to be able to do it frequently, you're going to be able to do it once or twice, in those circumstances, I think it's worth having a conversation or having, you know, whether it's a 15 minute call or a consultation, you know, sort of spending an hour with uh, with somebody to say, OK, so here's what's on my mind. Here's what I'm concerned about. And he's five. Given that and, and here's what's going on in kindergarten. Should I get it done now because I really see and understand the value of the baseline? Or is there a reason I should wait until he's a little bit farther with reading or whatever the question, you know, the, the core questions are? I, I, a neuropsychologist can help you think that through so that you can decide, do I do it now or do I do it later? In addition, depending on what your circumstances are, if it's like, I feel pretty good about A, B, and C, but D, E, and F are where I'm concerned, is that narrow enough that I can do a partial assessment and really get what I need? Or am I hamstringing myself? Because if that narrow assessment means there's these questions that will just sit there as question marks and, and we won't know how they factor in. Again, you can get you can get some guidance with it there. So that's the first part. The second part is let's say you do get the comprehensive. You decide he's six, he's eight, whatever it is, and you get the comprehensive thing. At the end of that, and this is something I routinely recommend, you that you in in sort of collaboration with your treatment team, including the neuropsychologist, can decide what do we need to look at in two years or in one year. And that might be, we just want to look at reading or we're, we're doing a variety of interventions to really focus on improving his attention and executive functioning. Can we just look at executive function? The, the answer is yes. You, you certainly can do those kinds of things. It, it's really having a, a relationship with the neuropsychologist and understanding whether the neuropsychologist is comfortable with that. One of the things we prioritize here, it, we, we, we've kind of structured and organized ourselves in a variety of ways so that we can be with you on the journey. You know, for, for us, the, the best circumstances are we we start with you at whatever age you're ready and we're with you until you don't need us anymore. You know, and that might be when they're 12 and it might not be till they're 25. But either way, our, our goal isn't, you know, comprehensive assessment every three years. Rather, our goal is what you need and how can we partner with you to support you achieving that. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to have just one more question now, and then maybe we can get back to the presentation. And but I know you said you're going to pause again. Sure. Um, so for those of you who asked a question, if your question hasn't been answered yet, we, we definitely have time to do that. Um, so a parent is asking a question. Um, in this case, the child has dyspraxia. 
um, which impacted the testing and the evaluator explained this in the report, but it seems that the diagnosis is not well understood. So schools have kind of focused right to the lower on the lower scores without understanding the diagnosis and how it influenced the results. Um, and so the evaluator modified the testing within the guidelines, but couldn't eliminate all the barriers. Um, is there a way that you can recommend to all, you know, all families in these situations, how to communicate this effectively to the team over time? Yeah, th there's, so I, I can give generic answers. It's it's not quite as concrete as, as we might be looking for. Right. The, there, so there's a couple of pieces here. One is it, it might be useful to give that feedback to the clinician and to say, that the my, what I'm getting from the school is they really don't understand what dyspraxia means. They don't understand how to apply it in this context, and they're struggling to understand how we can have a low score here but still be very capable there. And that the way in which the dyspraxia is making it difficult for them to demonstrate skills and abilities. Can we find a different way to explain that? Can you write an appendix? Can you expand the summary with some more layperson language? Can we can we have some sort of primer even embedded within the report uh, summary? just saying this is what it means to be dyspraxic in this case. And then I'll expand on that in a, in a slightly uh, more concrete uh, and nuanced way when we get to the section of the uh, talk that's on using the neuropsych in an IEP meeting. Great, thank you. Great, okay. All right, so the next section just has a couple of slides. The parent's role in the assessment process. Ultimately, as, as the questions are, are making clear, and, and we all know, a, a neuropsychological assessment is a huge endeavor. It's not just expensive. It also takes a lot of time. And in most cases, you, you can't do it more than once a year. And in the vast majority of cases, you don't want to. It, you know, you, you, the, when you're little, you're going to want to do it more frequently. And when you're big, you're going to want to do it less frequently. Um, so with that in mind, you want to make sure that you're getting maximum bang for your buck. And, um, and, and I, like I said, there, there's lots of different costs. One cost is money, but another cost is your child's time, stress, energy, those pieces. Um, so you wanna start with communicating to the examiner where you are in the process. And, and what I mean by process is where you are in uh, your child's uh, progression and development. Um, what are you concerned about? Is this the first time you're getting evaluation done? Are, are you nervous about what it might reveal? Are you, are you um, sort of in anticipation of, of what strengths it, it might demonstrate? Um, what are the inflection points, the, the sort of the why now? Like, what, why are you coming now? And, and to really be sort of comprehensive in, in revealing that to the examiner. Is it because the, that there's all kinds of stress at home that is a function of not knowing how to support your child in a particular setting or situation or time of day or with a sibling? Or is there tension between the spouses and sort of how to support a, a, a child's set of needs? Is there something going on at school? I don't have it on the slide deck, but is, it, is there something going on in the peer groups or in the community or with the extended family? Providing a clearer picture of, of kind of what's going on can really be useful for the examiner to think through what's the context in which I need to be thinking about the 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 child. You know, so I I'm, I I have your child in my office. I'm making all of my behavior observations, but it's helpful to think about and where are going to be the the likely application points. Are am, am I going to be thinking about reading class? Am I going to be thinking about the playground? Am I going to thinking be thinking about before bedtime? Am I going to be thinking about why why is he so persistently um, fighting? with his younger brother, et cetera. That can be really helpful because it, it, it allows me to contextualize and to, to sort of anticipate as we're going through the process, those types of scenarios and situations. It's helpful for you to clarify your goals and expectations of the assessment. Are you simply trying to better understand your child? Are you trying to refine specific intervention strategies? Are you trying to more effectively advocate for your child at a school meeting? And of course, it can be all of the above, but still saying that out loud makes a difference because it, it, what that should be doing is grounding and orienting the clinician to who you are, what your needs are, what's on your mind, and, and what you're hoping this assessment can provide. And of course, a good examiner will ask you all of those questions, but if you're coming prepared to say it's not just it, they that the examiner does the same thing with every person that comes through the door, but rather it's really going to be nuanced based on my concerns 
based on the specific challenges my child has, the specific strengths my child displays, um, you, I, I think you're going to approach that conversation in a different way. You're going to prepare yourself for it in a different way. And then where are you, I, it's sort of similar to the question above, but where are you in your child's journey? If this is your first evaluation, are you worried about a particular diagnosis? Are you worried about prognosis? Are you, uh, what, what, where, where are you in, in terms of making sense of, of is the, the things I'm most worried about that my child might not be who I thought they were? And what does that mean? Um, Versus, no, this is my fifth evaluation. I've been I've been to this rodeo many, many times. I, I, I know the drill. And what I need is to make sure that I very clearly understand exactly where my child excels, where they're challenged, and the strategies we're going to use to help them overcome those challenges. The combination of, of helping them develop and supporting them with appropriate accommodations and supports. It, that, those, that, that latter part's always important, but sometimes it's more primary and sometimes it's more secondary. So your communication with the examiner can be really helpful in you getting what you need from the assessment. Ask lots and lots of questions. If you don't understand why something's happening, ask. If you're wondering, well, you know what? He, he said he needed to go to the bathroom. I, wait, we took a break and he says he needed to go to the bathroom for an hour. I, I, how does that affect the test data? I'm worried about that. Ask the question. Um, ask about what are my child's key strengths and write them down you know, so that you can begin to organize your thoughts as you're going through this process with the examiner. What are the three to five key areas of concern that I need to prioritize? So here's the thing about a neuropsych assessment. It is designed to capture areas of need. Every single one of us on this call, every single one of us on the planet has strengths and weaknesses. And the neuropsych assessment is designed to capture those weaknesses. I think good neuropsych assessments also capture strengths, but they're designed to capture weaknesses. And it can be easy to feel overwhelmed by the weaknesses that are captured in the assessment. And some of them don't matter. You know, there, there's all kind. we all have weaknesses, and as long as we have a sense of what they are and we've found ways to adapt, it kind of doesn't matter. It's, it's just understanding what they are and understanding how we're going to navigate our life accordingly. So in the conversation with the examiner, when you're going through the feedback process, ask them to help you think through what's the, what's the key thing or what's the key two or three things that I should be prioritizing. The, the, the phrase I like to use or the way I often think about it is what's the current bottleneck that impacts progress and impacts learning? Is it is it my child's attention? Is it the language challenges? Is it the difficulty of making sense of the social world? Which of those should I prioritize first? Is it, is it that he hasn't slept through the night since he was three and you know he gets four hours of sleep and he's up for 90 minutes and he gets another two hours of sleep? Is that the primary Thing that we should be we should be focusing in on is is the school setting the thing that is is the 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 most dominant concern like have that be part of the process so that you have a sense of clarity as you come out and it can be useful for you to preform those questions so that because uh, as any of you that have been through a neuropsych assessment know that it can be an overwhelming amount of information and as, uh, and despite our best efforts to to try to uh, uh, prioritize or streamline there's always this tension between oversimplifying and overwhelming um, families and you know we don't always get it right and something you can do is to say these are the three things I want to have answered you know write them down or type them up and then at the end ask yourself did I get those three questions answered do I do I have a sense of where to go now do I know what my marching orders are tomorrow next week next month Okay, let me pause there again. Uh, questions tied to that for anybody? In general, I think a parent wanted to ask if it was beneficial to get an assessment every year or two so that they can get the most effective IEP. I, I would, yeah, I would say, oh, sorry, was that the whole question? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you've got a four-year-old, every year or two, I think is reasonable. If you've got an eight or 10-year-old, that's probably not necessary. Instead, to get the most effective IEP, what I would say is you you get your, your baseline or, or you, you get your kind of comprehensive benchmarks every three years. There's reasons to do it every two. There's reasons to do it every five. But 
all things being equal every three years. And then if, if you, if, if for some reason you feel like we're not making the sort of progress we wanna make, or we just wanna really have careful data to know that we're making the progress we need to make, then do just check-ins, you know, just, just check back in. Let's let's check in on that reading. Let's see how the attention's moving. Let's check in on, let's do, let, let's see how self-regulation, whatever the, the primary sort of focal points are, you can't focus on everything. So you're, you're gonna be picking and choosing what am I prioritizing this this month, this quarter, this year, and let that be the focus. And, and we usually call those uh, check-ins or follow-ups or, um, you know, or, or uh, and, and usually I'll anchor that. I'd like to see you in six to 12 months to look at X, you know, to look at reading, to look at attention. And then I'd like to see you for a, a, a comprehensive assessment in whatever it is, depending on the age and needs of the child, two years, three years, five years, it just, it just varies. Any other questions? The rest of them, maybe we can save until a little bit later. Sure. Okay. Okay. Um, here's the next part. Uh, neuropsychological assessments and IEPs. So I'm going to get a little bit more into the weeds of a neuropsychological assessment. I'm going to try to not do it too much, but a little bit. All neuropsychological assessments should have the following domains. Um, they might vary. The, the format and layout might vary from examiner to examiner, but these elements should be there. There should be a background section with a reason for referral. Why was the assessment done? And it should include relevant history. What are the things we need to know related to why the assessment was done? What is the reading history? What's the, the history related to social challenges, the anxiety history, the intervention history? There should be a section on behavior observations. The, this is a, a detailed explanation of what the examiner saw during the assessment. That might show up in two ways, show up in a section called behavior observations, but it might also show up in the individual parts of the report. So when we're talking about language, we might have behavior observations related to language. When we're talking about attention, the same thing. These observations provide rich information to contextualize and make sense of the scores themselves. You'll also have a section called results, and this is the test data. And, and to be honest, for, for parents, it's probably the least interesting section. Uh, you should read the background section closely to make sure we got it right. And I'm going to add something to that in a second. Uh, but we've got the results section with the test data. And then we've got the summary. This is probably the most important section for parents, followed by the recommendations. So the summary should be an integrated explanation of your child. It, when you read that, it can be anywhere from one page to three pages. It should pull together the your child. So when you read it, you're like, yep, I, I see the strengths. I see where he shines on visual spatial. I see that he's got this amazing vocabulary. I see that he's been doing math since he was a little kid, um, uh, you know, doing his times table since he was five or whatever it is. And I also see that I've got difficulties with language and I see how those difficulties with language intersect with the difficulties with executive functioning. And I see how those two together contribute to the social challenges or underlie the anxiety or whatever it is. All of that should be in the summary. From there, there's recommendations. The recommendations are usually broken into recommendations related to school or academics, recommendations related to home life, and then other recommendations that might not nicely fit into one of those two categories. And then somewhere in the report, usually at the very end, but not always, is the scores, just as like literal tables and tables of data. And the neuropsychologists, that's where they go first. They're like, I just need to see the numbers because most of the explanation makes sense to them. So they'll look at the numbers, they'll look at the behavior observations, and then they'll start backfilling with contextual history to, to then get the nuance that they need. Um, so my my I said I was going to say one more thing about, about backgrounds. The background section of the report generally comes from what you told the clinician and prior evaluations, the IEP, the last evaluation, all of that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, sometimes we don't get it right. Sometimes we we say something happened at school A, but it was school B. And it's because when we were taking notes, we we somehow, you know, our fingers slipped or or we made a mistake. And and that's that's where you're the expert. You You have that history better than anybody else. What I would say is you're, you're probably going to find errors in there. And it's not because the person wasn't thorough or didn't do a good job. It's just because there's a lot of data. And if the error matters, you know, so if the year is wrong, it should be corrected. But if it was um, something pretty minor, 
um, that doesn't seem central, like it was, you know, born at 38 weeks, but in fact, they were born at 36 weeks, or it was that, um, you know, potty training happened at three and a half, but actually it was three years and three months. Small errors like that probably don't make a difference in understanding the child. Of course, if you feel like it might make a difference, yeah, ask them to make the correction. But small things like that probably don't make a difference. Things are more more recent. You know, if they're describing a challenge with reading that they said was remediated by second grade, but in fact there was ongoing intervention till fourth grade, that should be corrected because that really helps us understand how they're growing over time. Okay. Um, Th think of that part in terms of your role in the report as a tangent. As you're as you're reading the rest of the report, though, it, it should make sense to you. I'm not saying that you should understand every data point in the results section, but it should be that when we're describing behavior observations, that, you, that, that the words themselves, the sentences, it should be accessible. So you read it and you're like, I know what this means. I understand it. When you get to the summary, it should be the same thing. And the recommendation, sh it should be the same. It, it should reflect what you understood from the feedback from the conversation you had with the neuropsychologist. And it should be in language that when you read it, you're like, I get it. it, it, it adds up, it makes sense. So it shouldn't be so full of jargon that you can't digest it. And it shouldn't uh, say things in such uh, an obscure way that you're having trouble visualizing what's meant by, by the sentences. And so if that happens, if you, if you get a paragraph or a sentence in the summary and you're like, I, I actually, I don't know what this means, or I thought you said he had a weakness in reading, but here it says it's a strength in reading, Ask that question. Say, can can you clarify uh, this? This isn't quite what I thought you were saying. Okay. I, I imagine you guys might have questions about that that we can take in a bit. So the structure of the report is important for understanding how recommendations work. So it, wh where, where we're going to go with these next six or so slides is to think together about how do we get the school to implement the recommendations that are in the report? To do that effectively, I think you want to understand where the recommendations come from and how the structure of the report is necessary to justify the recommendations. So you want to think of the report like a logical argument that explains your child's behavior. Based on a clear explanation of the behavior, their strengths, their needs, the recommendations should logically follow. So said differently, if we if we just kind of follow the flow here, I've got my I, I the only parts I put here are observations and results, but we, we've got the background history, the direct observations and the results. All of that, think of it as the foundation for whatever goes into the summary. Any sentence I put in the summary, like like just, just sort of logically how it should flow, any sentence I put in the summary needs to be justified by some piece of data or some description of of strength or need somewhere else in the report. The better summaries will pull forward the concerns reflected in the background by the parents. It will pull in the, the uh, most important parts of the results in a way that captures the child. If the summary does a good job of that, then the recommendations feel obvious. You might not know what the right recommendations are based on reading the summary, but it should be that the recommendations are, once you've read the summary and then you read the recommendations, you're like, I totally get why these recommendations are here because I just read the summary of this child. So it should be just sort of this logical conclusion. If that's not the case, if you read a recommendation, you're like, I don't understand why that's there. Go back and look at the summary again. And if you see it, great. And if not, then, then we've got some work to do. So, so kind of think about the logic of that. Each recommendation should be justified by the summary and the summary should be justified by the rest of the report. That's the, that's the structure of the report. And that's why it's structured the way it is. So what if my school won't implement a recommendation? I've got these, these, these five lovely recommendations I'd really like to have implemented and the school says no. What can I do about that? So the first question to ask yourself is why does my child need that specific accommodation or that specific support, the thing that, that I would like to see happen? And, and then again, it's, it's the logic I just laid out. Is that reason presented in the report? Uh, so I, I think the, I, the next slides will, will illustrate this concretely. I think my child needs extended time. I think my child needs a speech language service. I think my child needs assistance with note taking. And so I've got a recommendation that says that, but the, the IEP won't do it. Uh, the, at the meeting, they're saying we're not going to provide that. Then you say, okay, does the summary explain why it makes sense for the child to have a note taking accommodation? It does. Okay. 
does the summary, does that come out of nowhere in the summary or does the summary seem to tie back to somewhere in the report? Did in the background, did I describe that um, that he, he's had challenges with note taking his whole life? He's got he's got fine motor weaknesses and he can't think, you know, he can't listen to the teacher and write at the same time. And, you know, did I describe, did the examiner reflect that in the background when they told, when I told them that? Is there something in the data that sort of tells that same story? They're pointing to some challenges with fine, with fine motor skills, with handwriting. With, is there something in the data that's there? If it's not, if you can't see it, if you can't see the logic, then I, I would ask the examiner to fix the report because it, it means that they have failed to to do to to, to lay that that structure out there. Um, ask yourself: Is this a key need? Is this is this thing that I want them to do? Is 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 this is this the thing I'm gonna go all in on, or is it something I can live without? I'll talk more about that in a couple of minutes. The next piece is: um, Does the IEP reflect the area of need? And present levels and goals, right? So you've got the you've got the report that I just described, but then the next part you have is the IEP should mirror the report. So when you're at the IEP meeting, there will be this document that you'll be going over and reviewing. A key part of the document is what's called present levels. Those present levels, that's part of the document, should describe whatever the teacher has been seeing in school, whatever testing the school has done, and it should reflect the neuropsychological report. And so what should happen under present levels is whatever the concerns are that are carried forward should be reflected there. And then there should be a related goal to, to whatever the particular accommodation or support is that you need. If those things aren't there, then you should ask for them to be put in. You know, I, it would be, you know, doctor, in Dr. Black's report, there was, uh, you know, there, there's this whole section where he's talking about concerns with, um, with, with uh, processing speed and fine motor skills. And this makes note taking really challenging for my child. I don't see a goal related to that. And I don't see that reflected in the present levels. Can we get that added in, please? Right. That's the conversation. Once it's added in, if there's a concern that's added in under the present levels, and then we've got a goal related to improving fine motor skills and, and um, you know, and note taking in class, then getting an accommodation related to that is, is a no brainer. It's be, be, because that's, that's just how it flows. Um, but sometimes, even though from your standpoint, it's a no-brainer, like I just said, it, it, it's like it's straightforward. It, it doesn't seem like it takes a lot of deduction. It's it's kind of very direct, but they're still saying no, which does sometimes happen. Then I would say, ask the IEP team. It sounds like we're in agreement that this, that you know, my child has this need. And I understand that you don't feel like this accommodation or this service or this support is something you're going to provide. How are you going to address my child's need in this area? And, and ask them to explain. Okay, so let's let's make this more concrete. I'm gonna go through two examples. The first one has to do with extended time. Uh, so in the report, the background part of the report, this is the information you provided to the examiner. Um, there needs to be a history of needing more time to complete tasks. If it's a young child, that, that it might not be there, but otherwise it should be there. Um, it might be difficulty with fine motor tasks. It might be has always been reluctant to write, has been slow to write, to, you know, writing tasks take forever, so some version of that. And then in the results section of the report, there should be test scores that show that, that uh, your child has slow processing speed or has fine motor weaknesses. And then I've got a couple of examples here of where it might show up in the report um, on, under the, the, uh, the Wexler scale, the processing speed index. I'm not expecting you guys to remember this. I'm, I'm more just illustrating uh, how this flows. In the academic achievement section, there might be slow reading fluency. And more broadly, there might be observations uh, in the behavior section or, or elsewhere that the tasks took longer than typical. You know, that, that can show up anywhere, that they, they took more time than typical to get through this, or they did really well, except that uh, time constraints meant that we couldn't give credit on three items. And had we given credit on those three items, you know, performance would have been higher. Things like that would be in the results. And then in the summary, there needs to be an explanation of how slow processing speed impacts functioning. So, uh, so I've got an example sentence here. Slow processing speed results in completing tasks that involve visual scanning or motor output very slowly, including reading, writing, and math computation. So if I've got that in the summary and it's justified by the results in the background, then then it, it's, again, it, it, it's sort of a logical conclusion that this child would benefit from extended time. 
So when you're getting pushback, you, you've got a particular uh, accommodation or service that you want, and they're, and they're saying, we don't want to provide it. The way you can leverage the neuropsychological report is to know how the structure works. If, the rec if this is a recommendation you feel strongly about, before you get to the meeting, before you give the report to the school, ask yourself that question. This is a recommendation I feel strongly about. I think it's really critical for my child's uh, academic progress and well-being at school. And so I'm glad it's in the recommendation. Do I see, can I see just with my own, with, with my with my own, you know, kind of reading of the report, can I see where in the summary it seems to be justified? And then, and if that's, if it's there, usually you're in good shape. But if you want to be more diligent, then you can also look and say, did I talk about this in the background? Did, did the examiner reflect it in the background? Um, and then I, I think it might be challenging to look at the results section, but you can do that as well for the piece I'm describing here. Let me give you another example. Oh, sorry, uh, second half. So that's the report half. The second half is the IEP meeting. So then you're at the IEP meeting and you want to see that uh, in the present levels part of the IEP, that there's, again, what I said earlier, relevant findings from the teacher data and from the test results, illustrating that, that, that this child needs more time to complete tasks. And you want to see that they are reflecting findings from the neuropsychological evaluation that says the same thing. And then, and then from there, you should get the accommodation. Let me give you another example. Um, let's say what you're what you really want is speech language service provided by the school. So the logic follows the same way. I'm just going to illustrate it slightly differently. So the background section, there should be some indication of language challenges. The results section, there should be data that says, uh, yes, language processing at some level is challenging, whether it's expressive language or language comprehension. Um, and there should be some through line that is illustrating academic impact. We're, we're seeing challenges with reading comprehension or we're seeing challenges with writing or, or something there. And then we get to the summary part of the report and there should be an illustration of how those language weaknesses impact functioning at school. So weaknesses in language, here's an example. Weaknesses in language comprehension impact uh, the child's ability to understand classroom-wide instruction and impact reading comprehension. That, that's a, an example of something you might see in a summary. On the basis of that, we the recommendation in the report is an hour of speech language therapy to address to, to address those specific language weaknesses. So then you get to the IEP meeting. And again, you want to see that pulled into the present levels. You want to see a goal related to improving, in this example, receptive language, and a goal related to improving reading comprehension. And then on the basis of that, it should not be difficult for them to provide the supplementary aid and service of speech language services. Now, one thing I will say is it's not at all uncommon for me to say, I really would like him to have two hours of speech language therapy and the school to say, it's not happening. You, you can have an hour, but we're not gonna do two hours. Mm -hmm. And they'll have a variety of reasons why. And in those cases, I, I sometimes you prevail in getting more time, but typically you don't. Um, but usually if you've got something laid out like this, you can, you can at least get some speech language service. Okay, a couple of additional suggestions. Um, so ways to organize yourself before the IEP meeting. So if you remember back at the feedback, um, you, you've you asked the examiner to help you think about what are my child's key strengths and what are some of the key needs. List them on a piece of paper. Um, uh, if, if you want, you can even have it be a document that you want to have be sort of part of the IEP meeting itself. Because you want to think about the strengths and you want to think about the key areas of need and, and have that be those both of those should be actively thought about at the IEP meeting. And then think about what are your primary goals? What is it you want to get out of this meeting? Is, is your primary goal that you want extended time and speech language services? Is your primary goal that you want more social emotional learning support? What, what is the primary goal that you have? Is the primary goal you want to change in placement? Um, have that articulated so that you're clear in your mind about what your objective is which is a little bit different from, I want them to do every single thing that's in the report. That might be a tall order. And so it's gonna be, you, you're gonna, I think, be more successful if it's like, these are the things that I think are gonna make the key difference in my child's academic progress and, and their overall well-being. And so those are the things you prioritize. Similarly, you say, what are the top five, two, three, four, five, whatever it is, accommodations and services that my child needs? On the basis of that, of that thought process that you've come to before you show up at the IEP meeting, you're going to, when you have the opportunity to steer the conversation, you're going to have that be your talking points. 
you're, you're going to talk about your child's strengths. You're going to talk about how great the teacher's been and like whatever things you're going to talk about. And you're going to keep coming back to the thing that I think is going to make the biggest difference. The thing that is the, the having the biggest impact on his progress is, and then you're going to fill that in with whatever feels most primary for you. Th th that process should allow you to help the, 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 everybody at the table really have a picture of your child. Some of the folks will know your child really, really well. Other folks, they will have spent 15 minutes reviewing documents and this is their first encounter with your child. So being able to give a description that really illustrates the uniqueness of your child, illustrates their strengths, illustrates the key needs, can really be helpful in persuading the team that this is, this is where we need to be focusing our time and effort. And keep in mind that you're not likely to get all of the accommodations suggested in the neuropsych evaluation. And sometimes that's just fine. It might be that you've got a very succinct set of recommendations and there's four recommendations and all of them are make or break, but that's not typically the case. Typically we'll have here, here are, are it's not literally all the things that'll make a difference, but here are the things that we think will have an impact um, in terms of improving uh, you know, their trajectory. And, um, and if you can get most of them in, that's great. But if, if there's a couple that don't happen, probably things are still gonna be okay. Um, one more slide and then we'll take more questions. Um, provide tangible, so as you're describing your child, provide tangible examples of whatever their needs are from classwork and from teacher reports. When you can give a concrete illustration, you know, a conversation you had with the teacher last week, a, a document that came home from school, a, a progress report that's describing something that is relevant to the needs that you that your child has, it can be more powerful. Um, give illustrations of academic impact. So what I mean by that is illustrate how the concern or the challenge that you have for your child is impacting their ability to benefit from the educational curriculum, impacting their ability to, um, to, to access the curriculum. It might be that you, you don't have easy illustrations of that, but maybe you can demonstrate how a particular accommodation or a particular support made a pivotal difference in another setting, like at a summer camp or at uh, some sort of um, uh, uh, like you know re religious activity that they go to every week where they're providing a certain accommodation or a support that, that's really making a big difference in, in their ability to participate and, uh, and benefit from that. Um, it, it, those are good examples when you can, when you can illustrate that. Keep in mind that academic impact goes beyond reading, writing, and math, um, especially in Montgomery County. Um, the, you can have goals related to social, emotional functioning and well-being. You can uh, you, you can have accommodations and supports related to sensory processing differences and challenges. You can have goals related to social interaction and communication. These these do have educational impacts, and you can have goals related to that. And so there should be present levels related to functioning in these areas. And then you can have accommodations, services, and supports related to that. Okay. And then this is a good time to stop again with questions. Um, so one person um, asked if you have any recommendations for how to handle a family's report that doesn't necessarily match the services that a co that the college disability services office um offers and um and then there was a second part of the question um this person asked how can we accelerate a new report for college or help a family understand the limitations within the time limit for matriculation i don't know if that if um if the question asker wants to elaborate on that um but maybe if you could focus on how to handle it when you know the child has certain needs and and the disability office won't or doesn't provide those services. So uh, at the college level, it's tricky, right? The, so they're obligated to respond under IDEA, which is far narrower in, in their scope than um, than uh, education law. Um, somebody on the call, I'm sure, uh, I'm just blocking on on the the statute that references uh, education law for uh, for primary education. And so I, I, unfortunately, what I'm about to say is kind of bad news. Um, I'll give you the example of a, a report that I wrote that is a good example, 
I realize I'm making a self-serving comment, but I do this a lot, like in terms of supporting students in college. It's a good example of, of laying out the logic that I laid out here and making recommendations for note-taking support, for extended time, for access to teacher notes, um, and for a, an accommodation related to foreign language. Two prominent, well-respected, top-notch, painfully expensive schools. Um, school A said, I'm not doing A, B, or C. School B, they're like, yeah, no problem at all. And school B was, if, if anything, far more selective and far more competitive than school A. And and there there, there really wasn't much recourse. This was a this was a family that was particularly re well resourced and spent a year doing everything short of litigation with school A. And they're like, we're not doing it. And they're like, they, 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 their hands were tied. So so you're you're constrained in how much you can compel colleges to do. Um, to provide services and supports compared to what happens at the high school level. That that might only be part of the question though. Feel free to ask the second half if you want. Maybe if the person wants to um, clarify yeah. that second part. Um, we have another question about, maybe you could talk a little bit about how, how to address the lack of testing instruments for non-English speakers. Um, so it's not, they're, they're, I, I don't have good answers here. So you've got a couple of challenges. Um, for, so the core batteries, uh, meaning cognitive, language, academic, you can generally get across most languages. You can, but by leveraging folks at Hopkins, for example. Sorry, we've, Dr. Black, I, I'm sorry mm -hmm. to interrupt. I just realized I misread the question. Oh, okay, sure. Not non-English speakers, non-speaking individuals, non-verbal. Ah, oh yeah, you're right. <laughs> Completely different question. Uh, uh, thank you. It's a great question. So there's a couple of of ways to go. Uh, for non-speaking individuals, there are a variety of tools that are designed for non-speaking individuals. They uh, sometimes are designed for simply non-English speakers, and sometimes they're designed for non-speaking individuals. To to they so there's a couple of constraints though. The first thing is depending on why the person is non-speaking other modes of communication, gesture, pantomime, which is typically what they rely on, um, modeling may or may not be effective and useful um, under the constraints of the standard test administration. And if that's the case, then you need to explain that. The examiner needs to explain that. So what you would do is you would meet, um, uh, what I was going to say is you, you meet the child where they're at. So in essence, you 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 would do extensive interviewing with the family to understand, okay, so they're non-speaking. What are the manners in which they communicate? Give me illustrations of their strengths. Where, where do you see their problem solving? What are the types of scenarios and situations that you see the most creative outside the box thinking and problem solving? And then as the examiner, what you're going to do is you're going to basically try to work backward. How can I capture that in some standardized way? Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. We are often in these cases, you you have other specialists that we will partner with. So folks that have worked with the child for a long time that are able to, to give us strategies. Um, in our practice, uh, we've got a couple of folks that are, are really highly specialized in this. And sometimes the approach we'll take is to meet with the child um, many, many, many times. So we might meet with them, I'm not exaggerating, six or eight times for 45 minutes each, each time just working to build rapport, to, to get familiar with communication styles, to, to find ways to, to, act, to, 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 to bridge the communication gap. Then we are relying on those nonverbal tools that I described. The um, I didn't describe the tools, but there's a variety of nonverbal tools that can get at thinking and reasoning and problem solving skills. And if, if those are appropriate to administer as they are, then that's what we'll do. If they're not, and sometimes they're not, then what we're writing is a very different kind of report. Whatever data points we have, they're concrete numbers we want to include because they just speak so much louder than behavioral descriptions. But we, we may be limited there. And so then we're using behavioral, rich behavioral descriptions when we can observe them firsthand, it's more effective than if it's only by parent report or by a, a, another treatment provider's report. So if we can create the scenario and circumstances where we can see firsthand, oh, wow, I, I do see what you mean. I do see that power, that problem solving skill. I do see that creativity. I, I, I do see that potential. 
then we can we can do our best to put it in language that hopefully will be accessible to that that will be um uh, persuasive, accessible is not the word, will be persuasive to whoever it is that needs to hear it, if it's a school, if it's a provider, if it's a parent. Thank you so much. Um, we do have, um, Stephanie Frumkin has her hand up and I just wanted to let, um, Stephanie, do you wanna go ahead and unmute so you can ask your question to Dr. Black? Sure, thanks for taking my question. I tried writing this and it just did not work so well. Um, so I'm, you know, I have a child with uh, multiple neuropsychs, but I'm also um, an educational consultant and I read a lot of neuropsychs for parents. And um, so what I find, this is a big question that we have, that I come in contact with a lot of parents is that, so the parents get a neuropsych and it's really thorough and wonderful. Um, and it goes into lots of detail about home life, about, you know, their own child's um, experiences throughout time. And it's, you know, they get a lot of great information about it. And then maybe down the line, they're thinking, well, I want to apply to a private school. Mm -hmm. And some of that information is like extremely detailed. And maybe it could, you know, has private information about the parents, like, you know, maybe some of their diagnoses, or it might say if this child was, uh, you know, like in a certain setting that maybe they don't want to share so much, like with the private school. I'm not that, that I mean, I definitely would not, not recommend hiding anything, but right, however, right. some of it might not be so relevant. So I'm, I'm not so sure like what to expect, like what, what can, would have you any recommendations for that? I like, do. Yeah, okay. I do. Let's, let's, um, so the next eight slides, I, I, I'm not moving. I'm just going to move to that slide to answer the question. Um, so let me just toggle through. Hold on a sec. Uh, let's see. Um, here we go. So the, I, I've got this framed as should I request a school report? And, and honestly, the answer depends. Uh, so from my standpoint, and Stephanie, I can hear from your standpoint, it's the same. The goal is to find the right educational placement for your child. And the full report usually, and there are absolutely exceptions, usually the full report is needed to right size the setting and to provide appropriate supports. Sometimes because so much time has passed, meaning that it's been two years and the child's grown a lot. And you know, there, there's way there's things that are in the report that are no longer relevant, no longer apply. Like if if we're describing some uh, say disruptive and aggressive behavior at school that hasn't shown up in 18 months, um, there's reasons to think that that's no longer relevant. Yet if that's in the report, it could really impact a, a, a fully appropriate school um, considering the child. If it's something like that, I, I think even if you don't want to do a full reevaluation, you do at least an updated consultation where you get that data, you pull that data into the report, and and then you 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 sort of modify accordingly. But the 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 examples you pointed to, um, if there is uh, if there's sensitive family history or sensitive uh, any kind of history that simply isn't pertinent to the school, meaning that 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 information we think might uh, bias or prejudice the school against considering our child for admission, and it's not that we're withholding information, meaning it it genuinely is not relevant to the school placement. And there's not a ton of circumstances where that's the case, but there are absolutely some circumstances. In that case, I think it's appropriate to write, we call it a school report. Um, and I, I'm, I'm happy to take a follow-up question to that. Um, I think part of your question was, and then how do you approach that? Uh, the At least with, with, with our practice, I would approach it by saying what I just said. You know, any version of that. It's it's like we we're looking to find the right school. We're we're just nervous or uncomfortable, or we just think it's private information. The whatever that is in that very early developmental history that might not be relevant. So sometimes we'll have stuff when kids are three and four years old, but now they're twelve, and that stuff could again prejudice a school in a way that we don't want to have happen. And does it really need to be there for a school report? It hasn't happened in seven years. It's like, well, no, it probably doesn't. So then let's write a school report. Does, does that answer the question? Yes, yes, that's really helpful. Um, the thing is, will it, would every psychologist um, no. offer that? No, <laughs> uh, no. Uh, and, yeah. and I can't tell you who will or who won't. I've just encountered it. And um, uh, I, 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 to, to be honest, I could speculate as to why they won't, but I, I wouldn't be able to offer a compelling explanation because I don't have one. Right. But you don't, from your perspective, it's not, wouldn't be unethical to do something like that from what you, how you, how you framed it. 
Right, exactly. And, and you know, to, to sort of carry this a step further, I have been asked by parents to do things that I have refused to do because I didn't think it was ethical, because I thought that it was providing um, an incomplete picture. And there's a whole range of reasons why you don't want to do that. From the child's standpoint, there's there you, you want to have the right size setting, and that requires the school to be able to meet the child where they're at. If, if we're putting them in a setting where they're going to have to stretch significantly and the only way that they can make it into that setting is by withholding certain aspects of their history, I really don't think we're serving the child. On the other side, my report is, is, only, is only as useful as my reputation. So let's say that I'm just eager to accommodate you know, everybody. Um, it doesn't take long. In fact, I probably have to do that just twice before people are like, well... You know, it's a Dr. Black report, and you know, we know that he always does what the families ask. And I got burned twice by not having the uh, the, the full picture. And um, and at, at that point, then the usefulness of having my report is greatly diminished because I'm not seen as credible. I'm seen as a pleaser, you know, instead of somebody that's like really trying to do right by the child, by the family, by you know, by by offering a clear picture. This compassionate, this understanding, that's insightful, but nonetheless a clear picture. Right. No, that makes a lot of sense, and I'm in complete agreement with you about sharing necessary information. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing I have on here is that's this question right. about diagnoses, um, which I'll just since we're on the slide, I'll I'll just add that in. Um, families often have concerns about sharing diagnoses with schools, and in some settings, in some circumstances, I can understand that. the 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 rule of thumb I go with is all or nothing. So I don't mind withholding diagnoses from a school report. I'm not going to not like I'm not going to to remove a description. I'm not going to remove um, a behavior observation. Uh, I'm not going to remove something like that. And, and so any any and I and I, I say it just as transparently to parents as I'm saying it right now. Um, so any informed reader would be able to read the summary and they would know immediately like what my thoughts are. Um, there's just a there's just a section that you know would have whatever the diagnoses are and. And there are some families that are just deeply, deeply uncomfortable with that. And um, schools don't do placements based on diagnoses. They do placements based on fit, and that fits based on the description of the child. And in some cases, a, a, a diagnosis, there, there's a concern that it would it would misrepresent the child because of, of um, uh, stereotypes associated with you know, a particular diagnosis. And so rather than have the diagnosis in there, they would rather that the, the school have to read the summary because they think that will give a better picture of the child. And um, in those kinds of circumstances, I'm okay with that too. Thank you so much. Maybe I know we have a few more questions, so I, but I also know that you have more to share with us. So maybe if we could just leave a few minutes at the end, if that's possible. Okay. Yeah, how about I'll, I'll try, I probably have six or seven slides. I'll try to keep it to five minutes. I'm just gonna go back to the slides I skipped back to. Um, so common answers and questions. One, one is, is sort of how useful is testing? How much can it tell me about my child? That's really, uh, in addition to the stuff I said earlier in terms of it being, are there things that would interfere with it being nicely predictive of the future like there's an ongoing neurological condition or there's um you know a, a, another type of medical condition uh assuming there's nothing like that then i would say an assessment that did a nice job of capturing your preschooler is really good at predicting the next six to 18 months of the child's life but development is so rapid um in early in early childhood that it's difficult to predict what they're going to look like much farther out than that Typically, if you have a child that scores really high on something, they're probably going to continue to do generally well in that area, but I wouldn't expect them to continue to score really high. And if you have a child that scores really low on something, it very much depends on why they scored low for whether that's going to be predictive of you know six to 18 months out. Uh, carry that same logic forward, but by elementary school, development slows down just a little bit. And so it you get a you do a better job of predicting closer to two to three years. By middle school, you can predict four to six years out. So what that's looking like is in sixth grade, I can give you a, a reasonable idea of what they're going to look like as a 10th grader. By eighth grade, I can probably tell you what they're going to look like in uh, at the end of high school. Um, and then by high school, I, I think you can really, even by as late as eighth or ninth grade, um, we, we can usually have a pretty good idea of how things are going to come together. Um, there are exceptions to this, but usually we have a, a good idea of it. <clears throat> um, 
Um, how often should I get testing? I think we ended up covering this in a variety of ways um, earlier. Um, so I'm gonna skip that for now. Um, there were a few questions about why did my child's scores go up or down? You know, they tested really well as a six-year-old and they went down as an eight-year-old. Um, sometimes that's because there's just variation in scores with children. Uh, the younger you are, the more um, the, the, the more your scores are affected by things that nobody can predict, like whether they were thinking about a lollipop when you ask questions about something, you know, it's just like they're, they're, they're young. Um, but, but aside from just those kinds of unpredictable things, um, as the, the difference between test, uh, scores when you're say six years old, especially on verbal thinking and um, verbal knowledge between six and eight years old, if you have a language processing challenge or an attention disorder or a reading issue, those things are gonna impact how efficiently you're absorbing language-based information. And so the scores might go down as a, not because they're actually losing like cognitive ability, but rather because the way in which they acquire that information is, is being kind of constrained in some way. And we, we need to do some intervention to shore that up. Um, how much does neuropsych testing requirements change as children approach adulthood? And what's the best time for testing? There was a whole bunch of questions, like three or four questions I thought related to that, uh, just in the in the questions that came earlier. And um, the, the, the big things that change as you get closer to adulthood is thinking about practical life. So what do I need to be independent? What do I need to navigate the workplace? What do I need to navigate college? There's ways in which, in essence, we need to think about unchaperoned or less chaperoned. Um, how do we, uh, what are the skills that are needed? And so there should be a heavier emphasis. From my standpoint, there should always be an emphasis on adaptive functioning, but there should be a heavier emphasis on adaptive functioning as kids get older. And um, and we should be asking those questions depending on the, on the, their, the, their trajectory and, and what level of independence we're anticipating, hoping, expecting. We wanna be thinking about what are what's going to maximize independence what's going to give them the broadest range of options for for um uh you know for life paths and that shifts uh, not away from but i would say it, it, you, you want to supplement that focus on how do we maximize social development and maximize um, academic skill development which tends to be a focus when kids are younger not exclusively but tends to be and as you get older you're thinking more about these more practical applied things and in terms of when is the best time, uh, that's really going to depend on the child. Um, I, if we're really trying to think about when they're 22, 23, 24, I, I, would, I would probably wait until after 10th grade, but it, it, it varies a bit. Um, okay. How do I make use of school-based testing? Let's see. I think I've got... Yeah, let's, let's stop here. Uh, how do I make use of school-based testing? Um, I, I, many times we, we have school-based testing, and it can be pretty helpful. Um, but there's a few things we can do to make it more helpful. Um, when the school makes a request to you, when they say, we'd like to test your child, ask them, well, what do they want to measure? And, and think carefully about the things they want to measure and ask them to add in stuff that you that they're not, you know, that, that they don't seem to be including. Ask them to add in language. Ask them to check reading. Can, can they focus on attention, uh, depending on, on what it is? Once you get the report, read it closely and ask lots of questions of the school psychologist. I think the school psychologist tends to be this invisible person you never see, but I think you can make a request to have a conversation with them. They did evaluate your child, and I think it's reasonable to say, I just wanna understand it better, and I, I, I want a copy of the report, which you were 100% entitled to, and I just wanna ask a handful of questions so I can understand a bit better you know, what, these, what, what the findings are. And then some questions you might ask would be, how will you know, the weakness in this area need or impact my child in the classroom? Um, can you give me examples how how this might impact him in the classroom? How can I use my child's strength in this particular area to overcome this weakness in this other particular area? And you know, you might get really rich answers, you might not get great answers, but it's really worth asking the question. If you're reading it through and they're saying I wasn't able to measure this because of A, B, or C reason, um, you know, the test was interrupted or there was a, a, a you know something that impacted the validity. Can they measure it with another tool? Can they try again on a different day? Just push them and, and just see if we can get that data point. 
Um, and then the other thing you can do is consider a consultation with a private neuropsychologist. There's a couple of things that can happen in that context. One is they can they they may be able to do more with the data than what you can do in terms of thinking about your child's needs and applying it. Um, and they also might be able to take that and just do a little bit more testing. It's like, you know what, it'd be really helpful to, I see that there's a weakness in reading here. It'd be really helpful to look at these two other things. It would take 45 minutes and, um, and that would really round out and make it easier to... Uh, to, to tailor the uh, treatment recommendations for improving reading, for example. And then let me, let me stop there. So it's about 8.27 and we wanna be respectful of your time, Dr. Black. Um, so this may or may not be the last question depending on your response. Okay. But um, one parent had a question about, you know, any suggestions for what happens if you have a child um, who doesn't test well and struggle and has some behavioral challenges around clinicians that the child doesn't know well? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We run into that frequently. Um, so uh, lo lots of things. The, the first one is do a meet and greet. You know, the clinician should be able to see if 15 minutes might be enough to, to just sort of put them at ease, you know, like a week, two weeks, three weeks before something like that. Um, and, and maybe that won't be enough, in which case, instead of 15 minutes, maybe, uh, you know, schedule for something longer, maybe have them come in and we just play a couple of games that it like indeed are games and we do something that's a task. So we're just kind of building some connection and rapport. Can we, can we use some different strategies that are working in other settings to help put them at ease, whether it's using some sort of, um, kind of reward system or, or bringing in something that is disarming, you know, a particular stuffed animal or a particular toy that is disarming. Is there is are there other things we can do in terms of our approach? You know, just getting good coaching from the parents. Like, you know, I, I think a lot of clinicians with little kids, we want to come in with like big affect and you know and and say hi, and that might be exactly the wrong thing to do. So, so to to communicate what has worked in the past, what are the things that have been challenging um, before, and let's try to mitigate around that. And then the other thing we do for for kids that it's not it's not an anxiety thing it, or it's an anxiety thing but it's manifesting as as lots of other types of dysregulation. Um, we we can we can use um, behavioral strategies uh, only positive. We we never use anything that's that would be considered you know like aversive or negative, but behavioral strategies to to help them have a greater sense of predictability and a, and and a greater sense of safety. Thank you. So that's actually going to be our last question because it's about 8.30 and I'm just going to um, hand it over to Melanie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Black, for sharing your knowledge and expertise about the Neuropsych Report tonight. This has been very, very valuable. I've learned a lot and I'm sure everyone else has. Um, I just want to thank everyone for coming, but before you go, please go to the link in the chat. If, if um, Sylvia, if you could put in the chat um, a link to a very short two-question questionnaire about tonight's presentation, we would really love your feedback. Um, and then before we wrap up for the evening, I just want, would like to invite everyone to next to X Minds. Um, annual IEP clinic, which is next month on November 4th, actually in a couple of weeks. And it is in person. Uh, this year, it's going to be held at Montgomery Blair High School in Silver Spring. We will have two presentations, one at 12 o'clock and the other at two o'clock, one on the ins and outs of the IEP and the other on figuring out your options when you disagree with your IEP team. This is a special opportunity for in-person talks with professionals with plenty of time for Q&A. So um, I just want to let you know we will not be recording these. So come and get your, an your questions answered. And finally, sign up at xminds.org. Um, if you haven't been there, check it out and get on our mailing list so you can get notifications for all our events. Thank you so much, Dr. Black again, and um, everyone have a good night.